Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. are worthy for you alone are worthy for you alone are worthy Christ the My name is Jack. And my name is Margaret. And we've been at the river as a married couple for 10 years. As an individual, I have been a part of the river almost since the beginning, long enough to remember a challenge that Pastor Jim Martin gave the church many years ago. Which is the challenge each Advent season, to give away as much as we spend on gifts to one another, to family and friends. We know that every year during the holiday season, it can be so easy to fall into the consumerism of this time to focus on holiday sales, on holiday parties, on giving the perfect gifts. It can be easy to fall into the trap of focusing on how we and our families are experiencing this holiday season and on our wants, instead of remembering that there are some real needs in other parts of the world. Yeah, this year we know that there are places in the world where there is war, where people are hurting each day, where peace feels like a distant reality. And we are reminded that the Advent season is about waiting, and it's about waiting in hope for the work of God. Participating in Advent giving helps us to look beyond ourselves and connects our hearts with the longings for peace in the world. So this year, let's consider the ways that we are spending on ourselves, and let's focus less on our individual wants, and let's focus on the needs of others in other parts of the world. The intense and escalating violence in the Middle East has resulted in loss of life in the thousands, with many more injured, not to mention a growing number of displaced people and extensive structural damage. Many people are in dire need of immediate medical care and food supplies. The UN has warned that the situation in Gaza is fast deteriorating into catastrophe our denomination, the ECC, has long-standing partners in the region who have been promoting peace. 
These partners are well positioned to support aid efforts in the form of food, clean water, trauma care, sanitation, and hygiene supplies. Grace Shim, a leader in the ECC, said, At this time, our partners in the Middle East are asking us to pray in the midst of tremendous fear, grief, and chaos. It's heartbreaking to see the suffering and violence impacting countless lives. As the church, may we weep with those who weep and join together in prayer for God's peace to come, presence to comfort, and mercy and justice to reign. When the ECC responds to any crisis, they are committed to ensuring aid gets to those most in need, regardless of race, religion, or creed. Would you consider partnering with us in this response by making a gift through the Advent Giving Campaign to humanitarian relief efforts? Hi, I'm Lindsay Smallwood. I'm a partner here at the River and I'm so glad to be joining you for this, the third Sunday in Advent. Uh, my day job during the week is teaching middle school, including middle school writing. And uh, I love working with middle schoolers. One of the things that they love is memes. And so sometimes they share those with me. One of my students shared a meme with me uh, recently, a few weeks ago, because it's about writing. And it's a fairly popular meme. It features like average looking guy wearing sort of just plain clothes. And then sitting next to him in the front seat of a car is this fabulously overdressed guy in a giant headpiece and pink feather boa. I think it's from a show called Carpool Karaoke. And the meme my students showed me, it looked like this. Hopefully you can see it on your screen. And it talked about introductions and conclusions. It's perfect because we had just talked about this in our class on writing narrative essays. How so often uh, introductory paragraphs are full of anecdotes and metaphors and statistics to kind of hook the reader and draw you in and then the conclusion ends up being something like thanks for reading you know i'm out and i've since seen this meme in the wild a few times to talk about different kinds of things one of my favorites was this one about hometowns it really made me chuckle anybody else feel like they not totally fit in in high school just me maybe just me anyways uh, but my favorite version of the meme is the one that uh, adeptly introduces our sermon today, which is this. On one side, you've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and on the other side of the car, in the feather boa, the Gospel of John. And if you're someone who's already somewhat familiar with the Gospels, this might give you a chuckle. But if you're not familiar, I want to let you in on the joke. So there are four books in the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we call these books the Gospels. They all explain the story of the life of Jesus, albeit they do it a little bit differently. Some stories appear in all four Gospels, some only in one or two, and some stories actually differ slightly between the books. But one of the things that's really interesting about the Gospels is that the, the vibe in each one is a little bit different. So Matthew is a tax collector, and he's really interested in helping us understand how Jesus fulfills prophecy. So when Matthew's Gospel opens, you get this long history, genealogy, who came before in the family tree of Jesus to try to help us orient ourselves in that family story. Luke is a doctor and he writes these detailed eyewitness accounts of what actually happened in that day. And so uh, in Luke's gospel, we get those familiar Christmas stories about angel visits and shepherds and all of that. And then Mark, who we call Mark the evangelist, he writes in this really short, sweet, just the facts kind of no nonsense prose. And as you begin reading Mark, which is what Grace did for us last week, you see the stage set for Jesus's ministry with the ministry of John the Baptist. And then, then you get to John. John, you see why he deserves his feather boa in just a minute. As we open in John 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. 
The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. John starts in the time before there was time, right? The, the world without end. He begins his gospel of Jesus with a cosmic Christ, a, a word of God since before the genesis of the whole universe. Everything was made in him, and he is the indefeatable light of life. Woo! I mean, you can see why he gets the feather boa treatment in the meme. This is beautiful, fancy language that invites us into the story of God on a grand scale. John is hoping that we see here that this is not just a story about a prophet and a teacher that lived in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, but this is a story that transcends time and space, and it's about everything that's ever been. Before there was anything, there was a life, and that life somehow became the light of all humanity. I mean, this is astonishing. And then John, the author of the gospel, introduces us to another John. Uh, we call him John the Baptist, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. Now John, the author of the gospel, begins to weave his cosmic theological truths with the story that he saw unfold in the wilderness of his day. This man, John the Baptist, was preaching a gospel of repentance. Okay? He was calling people to get baptized and to change their ways and letting them know that something was on the verge of happening. Grace preached about John and repentance last week, and she alluded to the fact that John the Baptist was a weird kind of a guy. I mean, he was eating bugs and lived in the middle of nowhere and would host these revival meetings that people just couldn't quite wrap their heads around. And one of the things I find so interesting about John the Baptist in these early gospel passages is his refusal to make the story about him. John, the author of the gospel, says he was not the light. He was only a witness to the light. And the text goes on to say later in the chapter that John the Baptist took great care not to call attention to himself. Verse 19 now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, well, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. And finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to the ones who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John replied the, in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize? If you're not the Messiah and you're not Elijah and you're not a prophet. I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am unworthy to tie. Who are you? Everyone keeps asking John the Baptist, who are you? And John's only real answer to this is to locate his identity in scripture. I am a voice calling out, prepare the way for the Lord. John's refusal to identify himself, his, his obvious desire to not make the story about him is, is so different from the ways I think that a lot of us tend to think about ourselves, right? Who are you? From our very earliest days in childhood, I think we spend our lives trying to answer that question. I, I see it in my kids, right? This, who are you? They're constantly trying to figure out, am, am I an athlete? Am I a reader? Am I the math champion? What is it about me that makes me special? One of my sons uh, a couple of years ago got a magic kit and um, it was really fun. He loved it. He loved getting out and putting on little shows and doing tricks for us. We all loved it too. Uh, it was really sweet. And another of this, my sons watched him do it and decided that he was going to spend some of his allowance money so that he could buy his own magic kit and do tricks. And so when it came, then he also wanted to put on shows for our family. So of course we went along with that. 
But I noticed that the first one, the one who'd originally had the magic kit, was sad. He was acting kind of removed. And so I pulled him aside and I asked him about it. And eventually what he said to me was, I just really wanted to be the special magic guy in this family. And I just love his sweet, honest heart. Because I think that some of that is going on inside of all of us all the time. We just really wanted to be the special magic guy in our world, right? We want to be the popular one or to have it all together. We want this certain promotion or that boyfriend or girlfriend. We, we want to be somebody. And we're constantly looking for new and better identities to answer the question, who are you? I mean, I do it. I'm a teacher. Who am I? I'm a wife. Who am I? I'm funny. I tell good stories. I'm serious. I read really good books. And of course, truly, there's nothing wrong with any of those identities, right? I think many of the identities that we cultivate are wonderful. And oftentimes, they're even necessary parts of ourselves. But the temptation that we face as we try to answer the question, who are you, is to build our total identity, our, our sense of self on some purpose or idea other than God. To believe that one particular part of identity or another is, is the most important thing about us. It's the thing that gives our lives their shape. Our ego, the, the center of who we are, it was made for God. He created us in his image. Scripture tells us that he breathed his life into us and he intends to fill us with himself. Paul says that it's in God who we live and move and have our being. We're built to find meaning and satisfaction in God alone. This is, if you remember, philosopher Blaise Pascal talked about the God-shaped vacuum that exists in us that will always be hungry until it's satisfied in God. But we don't, right? We don't find satisfaction there, not totally. I think we're always kind of on the lookout for some new way to give our lives meaning. And because we don't go to the place that we ought to go, we have wounds, right? Ego wounds, soul wounds that are left untended to. You know how you don't really notice your body until it's injured, right? Like these are my fingers and most days they're just doing finger stuff and I don't think about them. But last year on Thanksgiving, I burned my finger really bad on the oven. And then I thought about my finger every day. It was painful and it was like swollen and, and tender and fiery to the touch. Anytime anything rubbed against it, I thought about my finger all the time. And I think a human heart, right? Our, our inner self that's not made whole in the presence of God is like that. Right? It's painful. It's seeking relief. It's constantly calling attention to itself. Our egos are wounded. And we walk around with this sense that something is not right inside of us. And we seek to try to satisfy our hearts in other ways. Right? Influencers try to find meaning. They turn their lives into a brand. Or there's the workaholic entrepreneurial culture of Silicon Valley where people are driven to sacrifice their personal lives and their mental health and their marriages on this altar of what they see as really important work. I see the drive to satisfy my ego in myself when I start returning to these familiar thought patterns of if only I had, if only I could get, if only I achieved, and then I fill in the blank with whatever it is I think I'm missing from my life that week. But John the Baptist was different. John isn't trying to prove himself to anyone. He's not trying to make a name for himself among the prophets. In fact, even though people are attracted to his message, he's not trying to build a movement. He's just a voice crying out in the wilderness. He's a witness to the light. He's testifying. And as we look at this passage today, we continue in our Advent sermon series, Surprising Words for a Sacred Season. You know, in Advent, usually we're talking about angels, shepherds, wise men. Uh, but this year, as we study the lectionary texts together, these are the texts that churches around the world read and, and teach from at this time, we're finding new words to challenge us. Right. Stay awake. 
repent, and this week, testify. The story that comes out of John chapter one is a story that's for any season. It's a story of, of purpose and a story of promise. It's not the one that we necessarily think of first at Advent, but I think it's especially a story for this time of year. And the story is this, in John chapter one, John the Baptist sees himself rightly and he sees Jesus rightly and he lives his vocation fully. What a beautiful thing. He sees himself rightly, he sees Jesus rightly, and in doing those things, he can live his vocation fully. What do we mean by sees himself rightly? I call it humility. He, he's humble. And let's be real clear. When he says, I am not even worthy to untie the straps of the one who will come, this is not low self-esteem. It's not like, oh, woe is me, I'm such a loser, right? I mean, talk like that isn't really humility at all. I think low self-regard in many ways, thinking about all the ways you fall short and what's wrong with you and all that kind of thing, it's just another form of pride. It's still thinking about yourself too much the way that pride does. It's You're just doing it in a negative way. And John the Baptist isn't proud in a negative or a positive way. He's not not trying to leverage the success that he's had in the wilderness to a spot on staff at a mega church in a podcast. He's not filled with awe in himself about how well these revival meetings are going. He could be, right? Scripture tells us this was a really big deal. All kinds of people are getting baptized. That's why people are asking him all these questions about who he was, because they wanted to understand the man behind this movement. But John knows deep in his heart that he is not the man behind the movement. He is laser focused on the reason for his work and the reason for his ministry. And that's the Messiah who's to come. John is humble. He doesn't call attention to himself, but he points to Jesus. Verse 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist loudly announces the arrival of Jesus in the story. This is the one that you've been waiting for. This is the Lamb of God. Now, that phrase, Lamb of God, you've probably heard it, but it might be a little confusing because it's sort of insider baseball for people familiar with the religious rituals of the Old Testament. In Jewish culture at that time, a lamb was a sacrifice. It was given as an offering to God for the forgiveness of sin. And time after time, people would enact this ritual. You would kill a lamb in repentance, acknowledging somehow in doing so that the true cost of sin is always death. And that death by that pure, helpless creature paid a symbolic price for the very real consequences that sin has on us, it has on each other, and has on the world. But when Jesus arrives, John the Baptist tells us something has changed. People are hungry for repentance, to, to turn from their sins. And now a lamb has come, not a symbolic lamb, but the beloved son of God. The light of life has come into the world to be the sacrifice for sin forever. John sees Jesus rightly. Behold the lamb. Behold the one willing to lay down his life in love for the whole world, the world that he has loved since the beginning of time. I think we often fail to see ourselves rightly because we fail to see God rightly. We have to behold the lamb. We have to really look at Jesus. Behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. You know, the, the animating force behind the entire universe, the, the word in the beginning has come to dwell with us. And God in Christ lays down his life for you on the cross, an action that says forever you are beloved of God. You are part of a never ending kingdom of love. You aren't just made in God's image, but you're invited into new ways of being 
You're filled to the measure with the fullness of God. You're forgiven. And you need not strive and ache and try to find meaning in the world because the meaning of life is this, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's what our lamb has done. You don't need to define yourself or look to others to define you because God defines you as one worthy of dying for, one so beloved that he would give himself up for you. You are God's beloved child. John sees himself rightly and he sees God rightly. And because he does, he's free to live his vocation, to testify of the light. And like John, we are called to bear witness that all might know the good news that love has come for them too. I wonder this year at Advent, who in your life needs the good news? Who needs to sit across from you and share their story as you listen with the loving eyes of Christ? Who needs you to be a minister of mercy, to be a speaker of truth, to be a bringer of hope? Where can your life of faith help prepare the way of the Lord in someone else's life? You see, we are the light of the world. We're meant to glow like Christmas lights in a dark, and weary world. And I hope that you will allow yourself to behold the Lamb, to really see the God who loves you and holds you, the God who understands your pain and suffering because as our Lamb, he suffered too. And as you behold the one who holds you through all things, I hope that you'll find the light in you begins to shine. You see, like John the Baptist, we are called to bear witness to a light that darkness cannot overcome. To proclaim to a dark world that a kingdom of light is on the way. In fact, it's already breaking through. That's the story of Jesus. The kingdom of light and love is breaking into this kingdom of darkness. And though our light might seem small some days, the resurrection power of God says despair cannot overcome our light. Sickness cannot overcome the light of life. Depression cannot overcome it. Injustice cannot overcome it. Fear cannot overcome it. War, poverty, violence, even death cannot overcome the light that shines in Christ. The light of life has come and that is our story to tell. As we close today, I, I wonder how you might respond. Perhaps in humility, you sense a call to repent of the ways that you've built your life on lesser things. Maybe you're tired of, of striving and, and trying for all of these different identities, looking for ways to soothe your ego and you're invited instead today to rest on the firm foundation of Christ. Maybe today you're being prepared to worship, to behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world, to see Jesus rightly and to allow that seeing to flood your heart with light again. I hope today you hear an invitation to testify to be a witness to the light. Will you consider who in your life might need good news just about now? How is God inviting you to tell his story? In your words, in your actions, how can you proclaim the good news? Let me pray for you. God, we thank you for these powerful words from the Gospel of John, that before there was anything, you were, that you are the light of all life, and that you have brought your light into the world in the person of Jesus. 
as we consider this passage today, God, I pray that you'll move us toward humility to see ourselves rightly, that you'll move us toward worship as we look at you rightly, and that you'll help us, God, to become people who testify that we would shine the light that you've given us in this dark and weary world. May it be so, we pray. Amen. There must be more than this O oh, breath of God, come breathe within There must be more than this Spirit of God, we wait for you Fill us anew, we Pray, fill us anew, we pray, consuming fire, fan into flame, a passion for your name, Spirit of God, fall in this place. Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way with us. Come like a rushing wind, clothe us with power from on high. Now set the captives free, leave us abandoned to your praise. Lord, let your glory fall. Lord, let your glory fall. Consuming fire, fan into a passion for your name, Spirit of God, fall in this place. Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way, consuming fire, fan into Passion for your name, Spirit of God, fall in this place. Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way with us. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, a passion for your name. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, a passion for your name. Consuming fire. Fan into flame A passion for your name Spirit of God Fall in this place Lord have your way Lord have your way With us
I would 